welcome back to Light the Fuse. Oh my God, Charles, there's a ghost in here. I'm scared. <laughs> Um, is this uh, in preparation for Halloween? Just make yeah, the podcast getting into getting Halloween spirit. Yeah, we're getting spooky. <laughs> and you know, I gotta say, this episode is scary good. Oh, oh, good. I see. I see what you did there. Nice. You see, <laughs> wordplay. Uh, no, we are back with the second part of Barbara Bain, um, which I hope everyone enjoyed the first part. I think she was amazing, and I hope everybody got a kick out of her. I mean, talk about a legend, like a foundational member of the Mission Impossible team. She is a, you know, prime member of the IMF, and we got to talk to her. Yeah, I mean, the legendary Cinnamon Carter. Uh, We've talked about it on the show before, but, you know, and I think we talked to Barbara about this as well, that uh, Paula Patton's character in Ghost Protocol's name is Carter. I think it's Jane Carter, and uh, but she goes by Carter particularly, and so we feel like that is a clearly a reference to Cinnamon Carter from the old show, the amazing character uh, played by the amazing Barbara Bain. So, yeah, we're just thrilled to have her on the show. It's it's uh, it was just awesome. Can't wait for you to hear the rest of the conversation. But before we go, um, oh, oh okay. Interview, okay, go ahead, Jaros. <laughs> I had something. Someone uh, linked to an article. I think it was on IndieWire, where this was a big revelation. Uh, Albert Brooks, the actor Albert Brooks, who uh, we love. If you don't know, he did uh, my favorite movie of his that he did was Lost in America. But he also did uh, Defending Your Life and uh, Real... Was it Real Life? Is that what it's called? That's the great one that he did from the late 70s. Yeah. Modern Romance is also great. I think they were all on Criterion Channel. I think they've all gone off now, probably by now. But uh, the, the all of his movies are hilarious and amazing. He was also the villain in Drive, the Nicholas Winding Refn movie with Ryan Gosling. He apparently always wanted to play a villain. And he said that it was only a Danish director that could make that happen. Because he was able to convince uh, Winding Refn to put him in Drive as the villain. He says, I know I wanted to play a villain. In between movies, I think there was the second Mission Impossible, where Philip Seymour Hoffman played the bad guy, which is actually Mission Impossible 3. And I wanted that part, but I couldn't convince an American director. But Nicholas Winding Refn was Danish, and I don't think he knew who I was. (laughs) So, Albert Brooks was campaigning for the role of Owen Davian in Mission Impossible 3. Can you imagine a Mission Impossible 3 with Albert Brooks? Yes, I would love that. I think that's a great choice. Um, <laughs> but I am happy that he did it in Drive because I adore that movie. And, yeah, um, I think he's better suited for Drive. That kind of casual, he's like a casual, threatening, menacing bad guy in uh, in Drive. Whereas obviously Owen Davian is very much in your face and intense from the beginning. Uh, and Philip Seymour yeah. Hoffman, of course, nails it. Yeah, He's also kind of a villain in Soderbergh's Out of Sight, though, as well. So True. But that's more of like a smarmy kind of... Yes. Yeah. I love that movie so great. Yeah. But yeah, that was that was a great little tidbit. Um, I love that. And also that Tom Cruise introduced Paul Thomas Anderson to Adam Sandler. Yes. That was a recent Collider interview or article, right? Yeah. I don't, I don't know where the quote came from. It wasn't... We did not talk. I don't think we talked to Adam Sandler, but Hubie uh, Halloween, I will recommend for all someone. Yeah. Uh, one of our listeners, I think is uh, Melissa, sent us that in an email. That's how I found it. She sent it and she was like, this is for Charles because she knows <laughs> I think she knows how much I talk about Punch Drunk Love all the time on the show. Yeah. So she uh, sent it to us. So thank you so much to Melissa for emailing that to us. Uh, but the one that she sent was from Collider. I don't know where it originally came from. But uh, yeah, the Tom Cruise it was that uh, Adam Sandler said that he met Tom Cruise when Nicole Kidman hosted SNL, which was in like 1993. And I guess they, you know, met at that point and got each other's numbers or something. And then Tom Cruise was, was shooting Magnolia and he called up Adam Sandler and said, my buddy, I'm making this movie with my buddy, uh, Paul Thomas Anderson. He wants to make a movie with you. Can I uh, hook you guys up? And so, you know, if it wasn't for Tom Cruise, maybe we wouldn't have Punch Drunk Love. Yeah, I think we definitely wouldn't have a bunch of junk love because it sounds like Adam Sandler didn't really know who he was. And then he went and saw Magnolia and he sat in the front row because it was sold out. And he said, oh, my God, this guy is so much better than I am. (laughs) Um, So it took some convincing. But, um, yeah, thank God we've got a great movie because of it. But um, we'll we'll link that on our show notes so you can read about that. And also the Albert Brooks thing. Uh, I just got to give some shout outs real quick, Charles, you know. 
You know I love Go giving for it. shout outs. Um, this episode is brought to you by Jeremy Dillon, and you should check out his podcast, My Favorite Album, where each week he interviews a different musician, songwriter, actor, filmmaker about the music they love and how it's influenced them in their work. And Charles, you and I were just on it uh, talking junk about uh, Mission Impossible versus James Bond, which I thought was great. Well, because we all know who wins that battle. Mission Impossible. Of course. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was sort of a depressing realization at the end of the episode. Like, yeah, we just really need six good Mission Impossible movies, soon to be seven or eight good Mission Impossible movies, then 20, 20 odd middling James Bond movies. But I thought it was a great conversation, and we brought up a lot. I mean, of- I love James Bond. I grew up on James Bond, but I am fully a convert to Mission Impossible now. Yeah, yeah. It's just the best. But um, so check that out. Uh, we know you guys like that conversation, too, the back and forth. So this episode is also brought to you by John B. And we are also brought to you by Real Estate Interest LLC, commercial real estate advice for growing companies. And what I want to get across here is that companies can consult with them even if they're not looking to buy or sell. That Real Estate Interest LLC help companies save and strategize as well. So they are just there for you. So if you have any of those questions, please check them out. And we'll be back at the end of the episode to wrap things up. Cinnamon Carter, like you you said before, was a different kind of female character that people had ever seen on television. Um, you know, when you were playing the part, did you feel, did you feel that? Did you know it as you were doing it? And did you feel responsibility? No. No? Not really. I mean, you didn't think about that. You thought about what, no, you didn't think about what the effect was having. Right. You really didn't think about it. The effect the show had, you kind of thought about because I would keep getting a lot of interesting questions from people that like I'd be in an art gallery and somebody come up and say, how'd you know about the submarine? <laughs> I said, well, the guy wrote it, somebody wrote it. Uh, there were a lot of interesting queries. <laughs> That's interesting. Like I had well, inside you- information. <laughs> And so this, you know, you said you receive, you get letters, you got someone from a, a woman who works at NASA. Uh, is that right? Someone who works at NASA uh, wrote you a letter. Was that specifically, are they talking about Mission Impossible or your whole yes. career? No, they're talking so about Mission. Talk wow. about Mission. Specifically yeah. that that woman on Mission inspired that girl, which, you know, I thought one well, girl, whatever you want to call her, inspired them to go to school, go to university. You know, I, I come from... Uh, couple of generations where uh, my high school math teacher, there were two of us in a class and he said, neither girl should be in that class on the first day to get out. Now we were had a, yeah, girls up can't learn math, he said. Now he wouldn't say that anymore. <laughs> Let alone <laughs> half the women in the world are engineers now and all kinds of things. I was told in the library as a kid, you can't read those books. I said, why not? Well, they're boys' books. I said, what's a boys' book? I got very interested. <laughs> <laughs> what's over there? Dr. Doolittle <laughs> was a boys' book. Why? It was an adventure book. Yeah. Girls weren't supposed to be adventurous. So, you know, this goes back a bit, folks, but it, that's how we were. We were treated. Right. I didn't think that was right. I did what I wanted. I read those books. I told that librarian, I'm going to read every book in the library. And she said, you won't be able to. And I said, well, we'll see. (laughs) And of course I couldn't, but I wanted to. You know, and I read the ones I wanted to read. They didn't arrest you if you took a boy's book, (laughs) but you were dissuaded. (laughs) Okay. You know, (laughs) all all the literature, uh, all the Tom, not Tom, yeah, Thomas Hardy books when I was a kid. Tess of Doverville. All I was a big reader as a kid, and I still am. Um, the girls were called Headstrong. I was called Headstrong. The boys were called Heroic. Huh. 
So if the boys upset the town by doing this, that, and the next thing, they were heroes. But if the girls did, that wasn't right. You were supposed to be quiet and stir the pot and say, yes, dear, no, dear, and be a good, loving wife, which is, you know, okay, too. But the limitations were quite apparent in the literature and the society around us. Now, that, a lot of that has changed, as we know, and we just lost the Supreme Court Justice who did a lot further to make that possible. So that's the way it was. I didn't like it. They called me headstrong. <laughs> <laughs> I have to ask about uh, Stephen Hill, who was only on for the first season, and, you know, he got a reputation for being for being difficult but I don't know if it was just, you know, you hear different stories about was he difficult or was it his just his religion that was you no, know, not being respected? Wanted, or, you know. No, Bruce wanted him. He knew about the religious situation. He even knew that Stephen wanted to leave uh, by sundown on Friday night as a religious Jew. Now, Friday night usually with a television series, you shoot late. But right. Bruce was willing to accept that and adjust the television schedule because he really wanted him. But he got more and more, I think he, he was unhappy doing television to him. He was a Broadway actor. He was quite a brilliant actor in his young days. And I think he kind of got a little lost with a long number of things. And he, I think he was very upset that whole year. And he, he was not easy to work with. Uh, and that then, changed everything but it wasn't the religion because bruce had accommodated that right. um, it was it, he was difficult in nature and it, it was a team so we needed to work together so we, we we did our best we never antagonized him or got him you know we, we all were kind of a little quiet footed around him we were careful and peter of course came in and peter Peter was a very interesting guy because Peter was never a boy. He was a man and he was very strong and clear and easy to work with. Really easy to work with. But Steve was, was difficult. Still Bruce wanted him. So that's pretty much what, there were various things which I don't want to go into, you know. Right. But he was, he became, he became difficult. I think he was just really upset in his own heart about he was a Broadway guy and he never quite got over it, I don't think. Well then he ended up doing like a thousand Law and Order episodes later in his career. Later in life he seemed to, <laughs> and he seemed to have mellowed. Yeah. That was kind of good to see. I don't know that because I wasn't around. He quit acting for a number of years. Yeah. At one point. He quit everything. So I don't know. And so when you and when when you and Martin left the show were you, did you stay in touch with, with any of the, I mean, were you close to the actors at that point, Greg Morris or Peter oh, Lucas? Yeah, did you stay in touch with Greg, them? Peter, yes. Let's see. Greg, I still see his family. And one of his daughters, has, she's a wonderful actress and director, and she's directed me a couple times at the theater. Oh, and, wow. Uh, I know a little kid, and I just don't know where to go. <laughs> uh, lovely, lovely person. And, uh, Peter, I talked to once a year, actually, um, a couple times more. And Peter Graves, we'd see each other quite, you know, not on and off. And then we lost, you know, them. Yeah. Which was sad. But uh, yeah, of course, we cared about each other. We really did. It was nice to have that camaraderie with that camaraderie that we had. It was good, good feeling all around. Everything about it was better than one would hope on a television series with long hours and lots right. to do, but very, very fine goals all the time and everybody doing their best. And those two guys in the makeup room making all those masks, inventing <laughs> them once a week. They were invented on our set. They became very much more popular after that. But yeah. they, you know, they were uh, amazing. They could produce them once a week. They'd have to do one of those. Everything about it. Everybody was there working hard. So that was a good feeling. I read somewhere that uh, that you you 
I don't maybe at the time or maybe still or I don't know you were, you're were, you were claustrophobic, and so they wrote that into the show for your character. Yes, he wrote that for me, but you gotta know that he wrote it. They they that's why he wrote that episode where I got cut in smaller smaller boxes. Very interesting because of course in shooting it one has to be open with a camera, so I was not locked in a place. Well, that's good. <laughs> And any time I had to be in any place, Bruce was very careful about that. He, he, he respected it. I couldn't seem to quite get rid of it and still have it to a great extent. I still struggle with it. So what was interesting is all over the world, I run into, I used to feel very bad about it. and couldn't talk about it. I felt kind of ashamed that I had this, whatever it was, phobia. No, I don't. And part of that is because, <laughs> Everywhere I went in the world, and I've been in many places, people say, oh, I love that show. I love that show. You know what? Which one? I really, I really like the one where you got caught in a box. <laughs> and that person was getting upset. And I knew that person identified with what happened. Right. And I'd say, yeah, yeah, I got it, you know. And they tried not to. They tried to just have a conversation with me. You know, they put you, they put you in this, well, they put you in this box. And I, everywhere, everywhere I went, people would refer to that particular episode who were also claustrophobic. So it's not so uncommon. Yeah. <laughs> did you, did you have a favorite set or uh, costume or anything that you can remember that really stands out from the production itself? There were so many and so many wonderful scripts and costumes. No, once I wore them all week, I never wanted them. Some people collect them. I didn't want them anymore, and they were part of, you know, something done. Obviously, the three shows I won the Emmys for are pretty important to me. Uh, right. the Blind uh, Empress, you know, that was great fun. They were the one getting caught in the box. I think that was one of them. Now I can't think of what the third one was for a minute. I don't know. But they were well written. They were a gift. Uh, Almost every one was incredibly well written, and that's just a gift on television. Now, uh, some television's gotten much better in terms of writing. Uh, there have been periods where it's been very good at writing on television, not, and then again. And, you know, the writers have to evolve and come out of who knows where. The same with actors, it's, it's kind of interesting all around. But those scripts were tight. Like I said, only one line ever. And, and the post-production, Joe Gantman came down to the set one day and said in the first year, he was a producer, line, I guess line, I don't want to get his title wrong, but I think line producer. He said, when you have a minute, I want you to come down, we're gonna redub something. I said, sure, okay meet him. We walk down. I go into the sound department. It was an O. It was a one short word they wanted better than it was. <laughs> I said, boy, this is called really meticulous. It was a great feeling to know that and it was Bruce was that clear about everything he wanted on that show he was just clear and that was heaven so it was great we've heard rumors that that you guys were reached out to by the creators of the first movie to be the the team at the beginning of the movie that that gets killed off you know in the first sequence is was there any truth to that were they did they reach out to you no i never saw any script like that or heard of it okay that may well have been on somebody's desk somewhere, but that was never, I never was, first time I've heard of it right now. Oh, wow. Oh. Okay. <laughs> well, here's another thing you might not know about. Do you know that uh, Paula Patton's character in the fourth movie, her last name is Carter, and there's a suggestion that she could be your character's daughter? Oh, who, who is it? Yeah, Paula Patton. Paula Patton. Yeah, not too bad to have a daughter. Yeah. yeah, I don't know her, but I have to look her up and see yes. if she's yeah. my daughter. <laughs> I yes. know that. No, I did not know that. 
I never heard that. Yeah, that is, yeah. That's kind of interesting, you know. Yeah, and you know they're they're putting out the the series again on Blu-ray, which is pretty cool for Christmas this year. Did you know that? No. Oh, the well. series, uh, the one we did. Yes, the one you did. Yeah. yeah. Well, good. Hopefully, you'll get a you'll get a check in the mail. Hopefully. I'm not sure. It was before those times. I just finished <laughs> with that, but it's still nice to know. And I had a very interesting uh, reason for calling. You know, an actor named Isai Morales. Oh, yeah, of course. Okay. I had a reason to call him the other day. I've known Isai since, I don't know a year date because I'm very bad at years, but we were in a theater complex together. He was doing a play. He was very young, and I was doing uh, Samuel Beckett's Happy Days, a very heavy piece and one of the toughest pieces for a woman in the literature, and I was doing that, and I saw him on and off when I was off either rehearsing or history, and he was wonderful. So I told him, and we've been friends ever since. Uh, it's a long time ago. But I needed to reach him for a reason. And I called his number that I have. And he says he couldn't believe that it was me. I said, well, why not? He said, well, you won't believe where I am. I said, where are you? He said, I think he said, Norway. I'm on the Mission Impossible set. <laughs> I'm playing I'm the heavy or something in the new movie. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Saw your name and I near fell over. We're in the middle of a tape, but I had to talk to you because what's going on? <laughs> he said the first time I, he told me the first time he saw me uh, was not in that theater. He had seen me early and had this picture of me and fallen in love with but some nonsense or very sweet thought. And I said, and I saw you on the stage. But I had called him thinking he was in L.A. Yeah. Because of the shutdown and everything else. He's in Norway on the set <laughs> of Mission Impossible. Oh, yeah. He was on the top of a train the other day getting beat up by Tom Cruise. So. Oh, my God. <laughs> now, that's funny. That's just plain funny. And yeah. <laughs> Next time you talk to Issa, I say, you know, there's these couple of weirdos that are obsessed with Mission Impossible. You got to give them a call. And then, you know, <laughs> you can bridge that that gap with us um, no, i can only see one of you i see i know i'm i'm in i know i'm hold on here i'll i'll turn my my light is out my lamp is out so this is going to be some very spooky photography ready oh well <laughs> oh. oh pretty spooky a bearded one yes <laughs> also see, beard but nothing like his beard no that's, that's, my, beard. that's my he's got he's got me beat yeah yeah that's my he's quarantine beard but you know, Barbara, we have to hey, talk. Thank about, you. <laughs> we have to talk about your your new movie. You've got a very exciting new movie coming out later this month. The new Sofia Coppola movie. That's so great. Well, I haven't seen it, so oh, I don't know yet. If they did screen it, and then they gave me. Never mind. I had a similar thing as today with you guys. I've also done something called Space Command. Okay. Which is some kind of obviously science fiction show. And I did it on the computer. It was like a four page monologue. And I just could talk into the computer. It was a very interesting experience for me. The first time I've tried to work on this. Right, right. yeah. Very odd experience. It is odd because you're, I'm involved with the technical as well as the acting, kind of split brain time. But okay, I did it. It came out very well, they're very happy. And he's doing a second one that I, will probably do as well. So well can you talk about working with Sophia? Oh she was lovely. She was lovely. Just lovely. You know, there's a big connection in my family except for me. Uh Martin, of course, uh worked with Francis. Susie was Francis's she went right out of uh college to, on a work study leave to work with Francis on was an apocalypse. She'd seen that apocalypse. It was uh Something in Vegas, it was called. Anyway, and then she became the associate producer of Dracula. Right. So she's very close to Sophia, who was little at the time, and Francis, still is. And uh, Martin, of course, worked with him, and I had not. So when I get this call from Sophia, would I do this? And, well, how could I say no? She's a darling person. Went to New York. We did it fast. I shall see. Oh, can't wait. 
And you're Rashida Jones's uh, grandmother, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, and I, of course, knew her dad and her mom. So it was all kind of interesting, uh, those elements, which are kind of hard to process when you really think, here's these grown-up people, and you know them since they're this big. Right. Now they're getting a little white in their beards. Not not Sophia, because she's getting <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, a lot of the boys who are kids are now like, why well, you got white in your beard? That must mean you're growing older, <clears throat> which means I must be, which is probably true, but I can't believe it, so never mind. <laughs> you look fabulous. Has your uh, has your process changed over the years? You know, I mean, you studied under the, with Martin and everybody. That was Lee Strasberg. Lee right? Strasberg right? studio. I, you know, I'm still involved at the studio, and I still I direct a lot in the small theaters here. I have a great time with a particular uh, theater that does a young playwrights festival. They uh, have a contest every year nationwide for uh, young playwrights at 20 or old, so they're teenagers. And they write, and they write amazing stuff. And then we bring them in, they're housed, they're given a mentor, a writing mentor. We don't change their scripts. We keep asking them questions. Are they sure they want that sentence here? Are they going to give it away? Or, and if they want it that way, it stays that way. We honor the writing. And they get a professional director, and they get a weekend where the show is up, produced, not read, produced, bare bones, but produced. Uh, over a four day period. And then one of them wins, you know, some of them have gone on to Broadway writing for Broadway, so I've write, been writing here for television. And I've done it over 12 years in a row. It's just very inspiring to work with these kids and they come up with stuff. In terms of my own process, I've still do, always been involved in, oh, why don't I try that? Or why don't I try directing this? Or why don't I try getting up and doing that? And I do. Right. There's always a puzzle to solve, and it's always interesting in the material. <laughs> it's like, oh, well, I never tried that. Let's see what happens. That's why the studio is so valuable. You can't try it on a set. You've got to deliver what is there. And uh, yes, has it changed? Only in the fact that I do feel I know what I'm doing. <laughs> 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 And if I didn't by now, that'd be a tragedy. <laughs> so, you know, uh, yes, there's more confidence than ever before. And still the excitement. Of, just a, It's an exciting process. I'm still absolutely in love with it. That's awesome. And you're still inspiring people, which is great. Each new endeavor and each new, you know, thing you tackle. So that must be a good feeling, right? It is. It is. I was very interested in what the young kids were writing about, and I found out it's the same stuff as everybody else. Love, <laughs> sex, betrayal, war, murder. I mean, it's everything everybody's been writing about since the beginning of time. <laughs> Not new, but interesting takes on all this. Right. Teenagers. So it's fun. And you have to be very creative with setting the scene because we have, you know, very little to do it with. So you start getting to be, I was just going to direct, not with a kid, this is a grown up play, comedy, very funny for the blank theater uh, when the virus started and we had a cancel of 12 actors and we just gotten cast, comedy. And then they asked me if I want to do it virtually. I said, I, we can't. You can't do a comedy in 12 people who have to move. Around. I kept, no, let's wait till we can do it properly. But it's called The Virgin Missile Crisis. And it's very funny about a young boy whose father is involved with what's going on in Cuba, but he doesn't know what it is, except the world is going to end. And he has wants, he doesn't want to die a virgin. <laughs> That's all he cares about. He's a teenage boy. And it's very funny the way it's written and developed. So I'll go back to that when we can. So, you know, so, <laughs> those are the things I'm involved with, which I dearly love. So life is good. I'm still dancing, but I'm doing it on a Zoom class, which is really weird. <laughs> you know, that's what we have to do. Uh, those are the things that are still compelling to me. 
Well, we we cannot thank you enough for coming on this Zoom call and uh, you know wasting part of your afternoon uh, j- <laughs> yapping with us. It wasn't a waste. <laughs> it was a waste. And it's well, two bearded good. men. Two bearded yeah. men. Well, thank you so much, Barbara. It was truly an honor to talk to you. Yeah. Thank you so much. We take care. Bye. You too. Welcome back. We just finished up Barbara Bain Part 2. The legend. So happy we got to do that. She was great. She was inspiring. She, She's what we need right now, I think. Right? Yeah. I mean, that was just to to, to have it. I mean, she's so sharp and funny. And, uh, you know, I'm just I'm so excited to see On the Rocks, uh, which, you know, she's in the Sofia Coppola movie, which is in some I think it's in some theaters still. And uh, it will be on Apple TV Plus. By the time this this episode... Yeah, so it's out. It's already out. It's out there. Go watch it. It's out. It's on Apple TV Plus. I will have seen it by the time this episode comes out, and I'm very excited to do that. Uh, It's with Bill Murray and uh, Rashida Jones and Marlon Wayans Jr. Uh, Or is it Marlon Wayans? He's not Jr. He's just Marlon Wayans. Yeah, it's not Jr. Yeah, just Marlon Wayans. Yeah. Yeah. Very excited to see it, um, and uh, yeah, very excited to see Barbara Bain in it. She has not; she's not in any of the trailers, but uh, very excited. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just uh, such an honor to have her on the show. Yeah, she is a legend, and uh, yeah, I cannot believe we have one of the the premier IMF agents on on the show. It's uh, it's great, but we're not slowing down. I just want to say that we have so many great shows coming up. Starting with next week, we've got the first part of our Michael Giacchino interview. Charles, did you notice that he had the guitar from Coco on the wall behind him? Yes. Ernesto. That's yeah. <laughs> so awesome. Which also we he's should say, in, you know. He's think, in Coco. Yeah. And, and today is, uh, you know, if you're listening to this on the day of release of this episode, uh, today I think is the day that his album is out. Oh, yes. Yeah. So that album is out on vinyl via our friends at Mondo and Death Waltz Records, but it's also available on streaming platforms and on on the Apple iTunes store. So just get it wherever you can. I love it. I think Charles loves it. I hope he loves it. Oh, it did. It's it's so cool. It's a concept album and it's it's uh, all original music, but it ha- it tells a story, and there's actual uh, there's there are voices on it. It's it, it's a uh, you know it's really it's amazing and gorgeous and and weird yeah. and interesting. I mean, it's a really really cool album, and yeah, it uh, can't recommend it highly enough. Yeah, and and if you are confused as to why there's a cliffhanger at the end of the album, he confirmed that that a second volume is coming out. Um, I think he said by the end of the year. So um, get ready for that. But we, we've got a lot of other... You want to tease anybody else, Charles? Uh, what is the name of the Chiquino album? I'm trying to... Because we haven't said it. Travelogue Volume 1. There we go. That's it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Just to let you know. And uh, we will dive deep into that next week and the following week with Michael Chiquino. So can't wait to have you hear all that. Um, I, I There are so many amazing guests we have coming up that I can't wait. But uh, for now, I just uh, want to say thank you to our, our intern, Abby Smith. And this episode is mixed and edited by Luke Burson. Thank you to them and thank you to all of you. Check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash light the fuse. Sign up for the bonus content because we do stuff every week. There's so many things. There's commentaries for all six movies. There's bonus interviews and just bonus episodes up the wazoo. It's just, uh, I can't believe I just used that phrase. Wait, the, but, you're, talking, you're talking about the wazoo, Charles? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you will love all the bonus content. Please, please, please support the show. Sign up for Light the Fuse Plus. That's where the action is. Uh, we we are always talking about all the latest news with Mission Impossible 7 and 8 and, and so much more over there. And uh, yeah, just uh, check out our Tee Public store, which is linked from our website, lightthefusepodcast.com. If you go to the merch section, you'll see some previews of what's there. And then you can click directly to the Tee Public store. Also check out our episode guide on our website. Uh, it has show notes for all the episodes. You can just go through there and see all kinds of good goodies, some behind the scenes goodies and some other things that we link to that are just uh, really exciting and amazing. So uh, check that out. Put a lot of work into that and uh, with help from our intern, Abby, who's who's amazing. And um, what else? Um, I want, just want to tell people to like, subscribe, rate and review wherever you are listening to this podcast. 
And you know what? Just tell people about it. I feel like that helps a lot, just spreading the word, because I feel like there are a lot of fans uh, of this franchise that maybe don't know about the, the podcast. And Charles will see me just inserting myself into random conversations on Twitter, just trying to get the word out about uh, <laughs> about like the fuse, because people talk about Mission Impossible all the time, but do they listen to the show? That's what I want to know. So I'm trying to get the word out there. <laughs> Uh, but please, yes, go go there. We've got so much great stuff coming up, as Charles said, and um, we couldn't do it without you. So thanks again. Thanks again for listening, everyone. And before we go, another mission, should you choose to accept it, please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. And remember that you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at LightTheFusePod and email us questions or comments at LightTheFusePodcasts at gmail.com. This message will self-destruct in five seconds.